Don't leave my phone on this week. Okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. This is Alan Lehman. I'm the pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in Chester, and uh, we're just happy that you're with us this morning. Wherever you might be in the world, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I am surrounded this morning by the ever-present and socially distant uh, praise team that makes all of this possible on Sunday morning along with you. And uh, we're just glad that you're here today. And as we get started, um, I just... I, Let's just start with a word of prayer. How about that? To get ourselves centered and prepared for this day of worship. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, be present with us as we turn our hearts to worship you. We thank you that you are present everywhere at once. And so we ask for the blessing of your spirit to pour out upon those who are leading us today, upon all of those who gather as a part of this worship experience and upon every worshiping community gathered anywhere throughout your beautiful world, may our risen Lord Jesus Christ meet us powerfully to the glory of God the Father and all God's people said, Amen. Friends, I'm glad that you're with us this morning as you uh, gather the family together. Let's stand and sing. We're going to start with Blessed Assurance and then Reckless Love.
that one or wasn't before. Hey, everybody, can we give these guys a big round of applause this morning? Worship is a participatory sport. You know that, right? So wherever you are, in your kitchen or on your back porch, let's stand up and give them a round of applause. <laughs> Sunday after Sunday, they come out and, uh, and work and, and they practice in the middle of the week and then uh, come and share their gifts and talents that God has given them on Sunday mornings. And for that, uh, we are blessed and I am very grateful. I want to chat with the children for just a couple of minutes, uh, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer and then uh, hear from our scripture story this morning. So, kids, I want you to know that I miss you. Hmm. I was talking with Miss Julie this week and telling her how much I just miss uh, seeing you here during the week and on Sunday mornings being able to sit down with you and, uh, and talk with you and hear how your week has been. Uh, so I have, a, I have a task for you today, uh, something I want you to do for me this week. You get to see me on Sunday mornings, but I can't physically see you when we gather to worship. So here's what I want you to do for me this week. It'll make my heart feel so much better. 
I'm going to read the scripture in a little bit. It's a story about going fishing. And I want you to listen to that Bible story, and then I want you to draw me a picture. I want you to draw me a picture of the story, and, uh, and either send me your picture, or you can have mom or dad take a picture of you with your picture, holding it up so that I can see you and your picture. And you can send that to me by email or text it or put it on our church Facebook page, any way that you can get it to me so that I can see you and begin to share you too with uh, the larger church family. So will you do that for me this week? I hope so. So you hang on. We're going to pray. And, and I tell you what, if you've got your prayer mats handy, maybe in your bedroom, why don't you run and get your prayer mat and then come back and you can join us in prayer and, uh, and then we'll read that scripture story. Okay? Hmm. Hey, Turner, have we gotten any prayer requests yet this morning? Uh, I'm still scrolling through it. You threw it here, but we do have uh, a prayer request for Hillary Champagne who has discovered she has ovarian cancer. Um, let me quickly per peruse here. We've got some people all over the world today. Um, that's the only one we've got in our comment thread. So. Okay, thank you. And I want to uh, lift up to our Trinity Church family, uh, Harold Harvey, who uh, was readmitted to St. Mary's Hospital yesterday. Uh, and, uh, and just keep him and his wife, Jean, and the family uh, in your prayers, please. Friends, we are in... Um, we are now well into the second month. We're approaching uh, seven Sundays. Today is the seventh Sunday in which we have been um, on quarantine or the COVID sequester, uh, if you will. Um, this week we have, um, we have passed another milestone of um, some 54,000 Americans who have died from the COVID coronavirus, and that has been in about this seven or eight week period of time. We have, uh, I think, over the weekend, earlier in the weekend, surpassed 200,000 deaths worldwide. There are about a million cases here in the U.S. that are confirmed. Uh, and all of us, I think, now know someone or know of someone uh, who, um, who has gotten the disease and the virus. And, uh, and so that's always, always present in uh, who we are and what we're doing these days. And so we're mindful of that as the church as we gather to worship and uh, we try to uh, speak to that through the week in our ministries of, of practicing safe distance and yet gathering to be the body of Christ. Uh, and so now as we enter into our time of prayer, uh, let us be mindful of those that are close to us and those we know of uh, and those around the world who are grieving and struggling with this disease. Let us pray. O oh God, our healer, show your compassion for the whole human family that is in turmoil and burdened with illness and with fear. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Come to our aid as the coronavirus spreads globally. Heal those who are sick, support and protect their families and friends. Grant us your spirit of love and self-discipline so that we can come together working to control and eliminate this virus. Make us vigilant, attentive, proactive in the eradication of all diseases and malaria, HIV and AIDS and, and others that create suffering and often result in death for many, many people. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. God, we pray this morning that you will heal our self-centeredness and our indifference that makes us worry only when the virus threatens us. Open ways beyond being timid and frightened that too easily, too easily ignore our neighbor. Continue to strengthen and encourage those in health services and in the medical profession, caregivers, nurses, attendants, doctors, all who commit themselves to caring for the sick and their families, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. We pray that you'll pour out your gifts of knowledge and science to inspire and give insight and wisdom to researchers focused on developing a vaccine. 
Sustain all workers and business owners who suffer loss of livelihood due to shutdowns and quarantines and closed borders. Protect and guard all those who must travel. And Holy God, this day we pray that you will guide the leaders of our nation and all the nations. That they speak the truth, halt the spread of misinformation, Act with justice so that all your human family may know healing. Heal our world, heal our bodies, strengthen our hearts and our minds, and in the midst of turmoil, give us hope and peace. This we pray, Almighty God. Holy One, we pray this morning too for your church family here at Trinity Church and across the nation and around the world. Give us patience to continue to worship you in new and creative ways that stretch our boldness and yet experience your reckless love in ways we may never before have imagined. Pour out your healing touch on all those this day who suffer physical illness, who suffer from grief, who long for companionship, who seek meaning in their lives, who look for love and acceptance. Hold in your gentle embrace all who suffer, all who have died, all who will die this day. Remember all your human family, the entire human race, and all your creation in your healing and restorative love. Hear us now, O holy God, as we join together wherever we are in the world in one voice to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, before we turn to our scripture reading this morning, I want to uh, give an acknowledgement, a, a thank you to those of you who have been uh, sharing our uh, online presence. Uh, those of you who have been sharing our Facebook worship services and our weekday prayer services. Um, this week we began a new uh, midweek feature um, looking ahead to Sunday mornings. Um, many of the, the, for many of us traditionalists, the, uh, the music that we play here on Sunday mornings might be a little bit different. So uh, we've started putting together a midweek message where it features one of the, the songs that we do on Sunday. And uh, so we appreciate and are grateful that you are sharing this good news with others because the, the reach of the church is much beyond just the walls of the sanctuary and the need of people for the love of Jesus Christ is global. It is universal. And you can be a part of sharing that good news. And so for those of you that do, I thank you. For those of you who haven't yet, I encourage you to do so. Our gospel lesson this morning continues the story of resurrection. And this is from the 21st chapter of John's Gospel. We'll be reading verses 1 through 14. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this word. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, 
Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. He called to them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, No. Jesus told them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And so they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There were these three fishermen who went fishing and they found, discovered, a mermaid. Now the mermaid offered each of them a wish. And so the first fisherman said, Mermaid, double my IQ. And so the mermaid did. And to everyone's surprise, he began reciting Shakespeare. The second fisherman said, triple my IQ. And they were just astonished because he began solving math problems that he didn't even know were problems. The third fisherman was so impressed with what the mermaid had done to his friends, he asked her to quadruple his IQ. And the mermaid said, are you sure that's what you want to do? Yes, absolutely. It will change your life, she said. Oh, please do it. And so the mermaid turned him into a woman. (laughs) This little story is funny, but fishing is serious business. Here in Virginia alone, along uh, the coastal part of the state and over on the eastern shore combined, the fishing seafood industry is worth nearly a billion dollars a year. And not only does fishing provide uh, physical sustenance, the food that we enjoy eating so much, but it also provides nurturance for the soul. A long, long time ago, I used to enjoy saltwater fishing, and we were living here in the Richmond area, and from time to time I would go down to Tidewater to coastal Virginia to go fishing. If I wanted to catch fish, I would go to the James River Bridge Pier in Newport News. And there I would catch spot and and croaker and maybe an occasional flounder. But if I wanted to just rest in nature, if I wanted to spend time thinking about the meaning of life, I would go to a spot along the Colonial Parkway, sit on the riverbank, and feed the crabs. Fishing can be nurturing for the body and for the soul. In this morning's account of this resurrection appearance, the group of seven disciples led by Peter have gone days, quite possibly even weeks, without experiencing the risen Christ. I don't think it's probably uh, too strong a word to say that they were in despair. Their lack of contact with Jesus, not seeing him or talking to him or being able to spend time with him was taking its toll. Peter once told Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. And now Jesus is gone 
and they are all left behind, feeling as if they don't have anything or anyone. It's just not the same without him. We've now gone seven Sundays, seven Sundays unable to gather together as a faith family as we're accustomed to. We are, and for some of us, it has begun to take its toll on us, this absence that we experience. And like the disciples, I think most of us know and understand what it's like to lose someone that we love. Someone who has taught us and counseled us, guided us, loved us. One who could see things in us that we never saw in ourselves. Someone who brought out the best in us. And when they're gone, for a period of time, we are at a loss as to what to do. So Peter, Peter goes fishing. And the others will go with you. Maybe they go fishing because it's familiar. Familiarity is comforting, yes? Maybe they go fishing just because they're at a loss. They don't know what else to do. We can't do the things we were doing. We can't go to the synagogues with Jesus. We can't go about healing people. We, we can't follow him and listen to him tell stories and share meals with him. What do we do now? And maybe they're just restless. They need something to do. So they go fishing and they fish all night long and these formerly professional fishermen catch nothing. Zilch, nada. They're out there all night floating about in the dark. And I wonder this morning, I wonder if they were remembering Jesus. I wonder if they were sharing stories, retelling their experiences with him, talking about some of the crazy things that happened when they were all together. Like, like that time that they were passing through Samaria. They were just passing through. When Jesus gets into this deep conversation with a woman, a Samaritan woman at that, at the town well. And before you know it, we're all staying there, spending time with the Samaritans. The whole weekend we stayed, getting to know them and eating meals with them and just hanging out. Or what about that time we were headed to the house of Jairus? His daughter was really sick and Jesus was going to heal his daughter. And as we passed through the market in town, it just slammed with people. There are just crowds everywhere. When all of a sudden, Jesus stops and says, Somebody touched me, and power went out from me. Find them. I mean, like, really? In this place? I don't know what was crazier. That he felt the power go out from him, or that he expected us to find that one person among hundreds. But when she came forward, and he located her, he just wanted to talk to hear her story, to get to know her. Or what about that night that we were on this lake in a boat just like this one? And the storm blows up, and there's Jesus laying up in the bow, sound asleep, none of it phasing him. We were scared to death, and woke him up, and he sits up in the boat and says to the wind, Peace. Peace. And the wind stops blowing. Hmm. You know, he, he always looked out for us. He always took care of us. And for the rest of the night, they flowed in the darkness silently remembering, pretending to fish. I wonder if, I wonder if a night of remembering was needed to lift their despair, to prepare them for what was about to happen. 
Sometimes I think we have to remember how blessed we've been in order to, to recognize how fortunate we are right now. Cast your net on the other side and you'll find some children. They could not possibly have known what was in store for them. An abundant catch of fish, breakfast on the beach with Jesus, and a new calling. Those seven disciples accept his invitation to cast here and reap an abundant harvest. They accept his invitation to share a meal together like old times and see him, recognize him in the breaking and blessing of bread and fish on the beach. The word of God comes to us as invitation an opportunity to live into it, to make it real in our lives. God's word incarnate in the flesh happens when we trust the word and accept the invitation to be, to be like Christ, to be a participant in what God is doing, to contribute to God's mighty acts in the world. When they had finished eating, Jesus and Simon Peter take a little walk. And Jesus asked Simon Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon responded, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. And then Jesus asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was sad that Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? But he replied, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The invitation to feed my sheep is a both and invitation. It's a call to both feed hungry bodies and feed hungry souls. It's what happens that morning there on the beach. From the moment that Jesus asked the floating fishermen, have you caught any fish? He's ministering to their physical need for food and their spiritual need for love. And sometimes I wonder if we we miss that part of feeding my sheep. Providing fish lifts their spirits, but it's the realization that Christ is present with them that takes them over the top. When Peter hears the disciple whom Jesus loves say, it's the Lord, he jumps out of the boat and swims ashore. He's so excited. Sharing that fresh meal around a warming fire sustains their bodies. Yet what brings them joy in all of that is being in the presence of Christ. And we get this, right? We know this. We understand this. We know how important the fellowship of Christian love is to our own longing spirits. How important... Sharing meals together can be to our souls. And we know now what it's like to be separated from the church. We understand what it feels like to be detached from the spirit of love and joy we find when we come together and are present with one another in the church. The dark night of COVID sequester has made us realize this, how we long for loving, 
accepting relationship. So maybe one of the things that we now realize after just seven weeks of this, maybe what we begin to understand is what it's like to long for unconventional love and acceptance in the family of Christ and and not be welcomed there, to not be welcomed here. How painful that must be for those who long for love and acceptance. It took a dark night on the water for the disciples to realize that they could not go back to their old way of life. On the water, they remember Jesus. They remember what he did to them and for them, the transformation they underwent as people. His willingness, no, not strong enough word, his desire to do anything for them, anything they needed. The love he gave, asking nothing in return, that reckless love, just inviting always inviting come follow me love one another as I have loved you in the light of the morning it was a it was a little Easter it was a resurrection moment to honor Christ to be his disciple having given up everything that is to claim that Christ is the most important thing in my life meant beginning again. Sharing the love with a hungry, hurting world. This, to feed my sheep. This was their calling. Friends, might we be at a resurrection moment? Might we be in the midst of our own little Easter? A place of beginning again pressed by the solitude and reflection of this season of the COVID sequester, are we ready to answer the call of Jesus to move from what we get to what we can give, to grow from what I get from church to what I can contribute to the body of Christ? Is Christ calling you? Feed my sheep. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the the image of the disciples in the boat, in the dark of night, on the beach, in the light of day. We thank you for the word that calls us, beckons us to follow Christ. So this morning, oh God, we pray for strength and courage. We pray for boldness to follow him wherever he might lead us. It's in his powerful, living, resurrected name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, I invite you to stand. And uh, we're going to uh, recite a, um, a statement of affirming our faith that this is what we believe. Today's affirmation comes from uh, a compilation of Paul's letters from 1 Corinthians and 1 Colossians. And when it's in front of me, I will lead it with you. You should have this in your, um, hopefully you can see it on screen maybe, or uh, you may have picked it up this week in the email that came out. So friends, this is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, in which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, 
the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Friends, our sending song this morning as we get ready for that is Happy Day. Uh, this is the song that Turner previewed for us uh, middle of the week. Uh, so I hope you've been practicing it, uh, singing along to that video clip. Uh, you have the words in front of you, I hope, this morning. And I just want to thank you for being here today. And uh, know that we'll be back here next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for live worship on Facebook. And Monday through Friday, we have morning prayers at 8.30 a.m. Uh, that's also on our Facebook page. Thank you for being here this morning. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Somebody say amen. Hey, friends, receive this blessing. 
The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.